Sentinel is a character that basically says, okay, start here. This is, um, you know, this is, this is the start of the track. This is where you start decoding and calculating the checksum. Um, you'll see a format code, you'll find, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll find that the format code is like B for a bank card. Uh, there's a couple of other characters that, f that define different types of cards, but um, you can look all this stuff up. Um, the primary count number, a field separator. Uh, on track one, since it's alphanumeric, you'll find your name. Another field separator, additional data and discretionary data. Discretionary data is variable depending on the organization that's issuing the card. Um, it's hard to tell what you'll find there. There's all sorts of crazy stuff you'll find. Um, and the end sentinel, and that's when you know uh, that's wh that's when you know where to stop reading for uh, reading for characters and start calculating the checksum, and then you calculate the LRC from that and compare it to what's uh, what's next, what the next character you read is, and that's how you know whether or not you have a valid read. Um, it's very similar for track two, except it's only numeric data. Uh, you won't find your name on there, but you'll find pretty much the same information that you'll find on check on track one, and this is again with uh, ATM cards, credit cards, stuff like that. Um, okay, so for the reverse, uh, reverse engineering bit, uh, when, you, when you find a card that doesn't conform to any standards, it's, it's kind of difficult to know where to start. And, um, and luckily I was able to start with the standard stuff, which is pretty well, well documented. Um, okay, so how do, you, how do you do this without knowing what data is encoded on them? Basically, you want to be able to do something like uh, write a program to parse the raw binary output and say, okay, well, parse it into something I could read, find out exactly what's on the card, what each field means, Etc. And so, uh, and so, let me show you real quick some of the differences that I found between uh, the Metro card and standard cards. In case any of you come across uh, proprietary formats that you wanna that you wanna take a look at. Okay. So I just swiped a, uh, a standard Metro card from uh, this is from the New York City Transit System. And it looks, it looks similar to what I swiped before with a standard card, except you'll notice at the beginning, all those clocking bits that I mentioned before, they're not there. Um, it starts with a zero bit, and then here, in this case, there's another zero bit and a one bit and whatever. And so it's not, it's not exactly the same as the other cards. Um, standard, uh, standard readers are looking for quite a few um, clocking bits to set their internal clock, and metric cards just simply don't have that. Um, also, what you notice if you actually decode the binary and try to checksum it is that there's no LRC at the end. There's no checksum that you could do. Um, there's no start sentinel. There's no end sentinel. You don't really know where to start and then decoding the data. And so it's, it's really a proprietary format that's kind of, uh, kind of lousy. Um, so what I had to do was modify the program to, uh, to ignore all the clocking bits. Basically, it takes the first bit and assumes it's a zero, which is uh, a pretty bad assumption because a lot of times, it'll, the, um, the, uh, the encoded data at the beginning of the card will be a little bit weak. And you really want to have a lot of clocking bits to average it out to really find what uh, the average dif distance between uh, the zero bits are. So ignoring all that, we can swipe, uh, we can swipe a metric card. Oh, I don't want to run it through this because that'll, that'll fail. And, and get the binary data. That's after all the modifications. There are there a couple of other differences as well that I'll, um, I'll mention later. And so, okay, so what do you do with that once you get, uh, once you get all this raw data from, from the magnetic stripe? Well, you have, to, you have to sort of find a way to analyze it. You have to, you have to get a bunch of cards to get, uh, in this, and this is common with most uh, types of reverse engineering, you try, to keep, try to get as many samples as you can with as much data as you can remaining constant across, the, uh, across your set of cards. So what I did was I went into the subway system, bought 10 cards from the same vending machine, and what you get is you get 10 cards, you get the same value. Thank you. Uh, all the cards have the same value on it. They all have uh, sequential serial numbers because of the batch. When they stick the batch in, they're all sequential. Uh, you purchase them from the same place. You purchase them, you know, from the same uh, from the same station. You haven't used them, so the number of times you use them is the same, same same value and everything. So when you read these cards, you'll notice that a lot of the bits are the same. You have you have the same value. Like I said, you have all these fields that are constant, except for the serial number field. And you'll notice that, okay, well, okay, here's a field where. The, the raw binary is increasing by one every time. So you can, you can easily uh, 
narrow it down to this field being the serial number field. So then you go and you say, okay, well, what can I change next? And you swipe two or three of the cards at the same turnstile. Um, maybe you wanna maybe you wanna deduct one or two fares from each, so you'll have you know three cards. One of them has ten dollars, one of them has eight, and one of them has six. Now, all again, you know the serial number field, so you could ignore that. But now the value field is different, so you can again go look and see what changed, and and you see okay, well, a couple of bits of of binary have changed here. What could that be? Okay, that's the that's the value. And, uh, and sometimes it's, it's a little bit hard to see where they, where they start and end, but as you, as you track more fields down and you see the least significant bits changing, you can, you can kind of judge that, okay, the next one is the most significant bit for the next field. And so you don't have to do it, you don't have to be that drastic as far as um, how much money you put on it or you know, how high of a serial number you could get. Or, you know, so you can, uh, you can eliminate it. Uh, eliminate a lot of the fields pretty easily. And there's still, uh, there, I mean, I found that there was a whole lot of data on these cards um, that most people have no idea is there. Um, I f uh, I'll show you exactly what's on them in a second. Okay, so this is track three of the Metro card. Um, what it turns out is that Metro cards have uh, two tracks. One is, one is where track three would normally be on a standard card, and, uh, and track one, two, as I call it, is is a wide track that occupies a space that uh, tracks one and two would occupy on a standard card. So you could set you could set the position of the read head to either track one or track two and read exact, exactly the same data from the card. Um, in in my case, the original the original reader that I used to do all this. Let me see, do I have it? Here? Let me see if I could find it real quick. Okay, uh, the original reader that I used when I first started developing this was. Exactly what I mentioned before. It was a, it was, 3.5 millimeter jack. Cut off a pair of headphones. Um, this is a cassette tape head with a bunch of electrical tape around it. That's it. Um, what you have to do with this is, is kind of a pain. You have to kind of, you know, clamp the car down or put a weight on the card and use a ruler to align it and sort of drag it along the magnetic stripe. And I could try it now, but I don't really have anything to do it accurately with. So. It, It'll probably take me a couple of tries, but this is this is all you need to read magnetic stripes. You know, it's it's really not complicated at all. What I have here uh, that I'm using to demo today is um, a surplus reader that I got. This actually came with a TTL decoder, uh, which outputs TTL logic levels uh, for each bit that's decoded. Um, but I bypassed all that circuitry and just patched in another 3.5 millimeter jack directly to the uh, to the to the read head, like exactly like I did with the other one, except now I have this nice track to slide the card through, so it's, it's much easier. I don't have to sit there with a ruler and play with it like that. But, um, and, and, it, and it works really well and really reliably. The only issue is I could only read one track at a time, and to change the head, I have to open it and, and move the head. But I'm sure one of you guys could, who are good with mechanical stuff can develop something to, to switch the head. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm using to read the cards. You can you can you could find these surplus readers for like five dollars, or you know on on surplus sites where people have bought too many or companies are discarding them and, and using something else or whatever. They're very cheap, very easy to find, and you could easily modify it to, to use with this application. So anyway, some of the data that that was on track three um, was a, f a fifteen digit start sentinel, um, fifteen bit. I'm sorry, start sentinel. Um, the next four bits define the card type. The next four I don't really know. Um, the next four define the expiration date. The next four again I don't know. There's 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 quite a few uh, uh, fields on this track that I don't know. Um, track three stays constant across all the reads. So when you uh, when you go from, you know, if you if you go into the bus or you go into the subway, um, all this data stays constant. None of this stuff none of this stuff changes from the time that the card is produced till the time that uh, till the time that you finish using it. Um, Again, serial numbers on there, um, and then a, a couple of other things that I don't know uh, are on there as well. And uh, track, track one and two is much easier to, to narrow down because this is all the data that changes. And, and the method that I used before, like I said, uh, is just trying to keep as much of this constant and changing one at a time, which, which allowed me to eliminate a lot of fields. So um, it, it was weird. The time was split between two, uh, between two fields on the card. Um, the card subtype, which basically, um, which basically told whether or not it's, uh, it's an unlimited card, a pay-per-ride card, um, or any of the n other number types of cards that you can buy as a regular citizen. There's a couple of other kinds of cards which are defined by the, uh, 
the card type set on track three, which are student cards, reduced fare cards, employee cards, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, again, and the number of times the card was used, uh, the expiration date, whether or not you would use it for a transfer, um, the last time you used it, where, where the last place you used it was, and where you purchased it from, and most importantly, the value of the card. And, uh, and now getting to, uh, back to the story in the beginning, I was trying to figure out, okay, well, why were you able to bend the corner of the card and, and get a free ride in the subway? It didn't, didn't make sense. Well, it turns out that on track one and two, um, halfway down the middle of the card, there's, uh, there's another abnormality in the, uh, in the encoding scheme, whereas there's a half a bit. Now, there's a zero bit, which is you know, a full length uh, of the clocking bit. Uh, there's a one bit, which is half the length of the clocking bit. And then there's, there's half of that. And that sort of divides the card into two records. So the first record, for example, when you buy, uh, the first and second record, for example, when you buy a $10 Metro card, will be set all the fields exactly the same on the first and the second record. The, um, the card value will be 10 on both. But when you, use, when you use a card for the first time, the first record will change to say that you have $8 on the card. The second record will still remain the last transaction. You, you keep doing this until the card's empty. And, and it turns out that um, when you get to the end, half the card says you have no, you know, has no value. You have, you have no more. Uh, you, ha you, ha you, don't, you can't enter the subway, you can't enter the bus, you have, no, you have no value on the card. And the other half still says you have $2. Um, this was probably done when they changed, uh, when they were doing the experimental uh, MetroCard system and everybody was having a hard time getting into the system. Uh, like I said, it, it's kind of a crappy way of doing it. You don't have very many clocking bits, you don't have a lot of stuff that you have in standard cards to ensure that you have proper reads. Um, and so people were standing at the turnstiles for, you know, 20 minutes trying to get in with their MetroCard and it just wasn't working. Um, and so what, what I believe the, uh, the result of that was, was for them to implement this where they have two records for redundancy. Um, again, where the second record is the last transaction and the first record is the current transaction. So what happens is um, you bend the corner of the card, right, and, and you're creating a read error in the, last trans in, in the current transaction. So when you swipe the card, it'll, it'll give you an error like, okay, please, please swipe again in this turnstile. Um, you swipe it again and, and it'll give you the same error. And then the third time it'll say, okay, fine. I'll, I'll accept the card, I'll assume that the last record is valid even though it's not, and it'll let, it, it'll, it'll let you into the subway even though you have no, no value on the card. And, and so that's what it turned, it turned out to be after all this work trying to go these cards. Um, the MTA recently came up with a solution for this, which was to, to update the firmware in the, um, in the, in the readers. And they didn't, they didn't want to inval invalidate all the cards that they had been issued, so their trick was to treat the last swipe, whereas you have uh, you have less than one fare remaining after the swipe as a transfer. So they make you actually swipe it twice in the turnstile before they let you in, um, which is interesting because, it's, uh, because they must have updated something else to allow, uh, to allow uh, buses and subways to sense whether or not it was actually a transfer, which I haven't found yet, but um, it does set the transfer bit the second time. Anyway, so that's, that's the solution to that. Um, what are the implications of this? Well, first of all, Again, it's extremely cheap to make. You can, you can really, like I said, make this in minutes and explore you know, different magnetic stripe cards that you have laying around. Um, you could view all these proprietary, uh, the data on all these proprietary cards. And, uh, and again, you can expose pu uh, poor uh, security through obscurity models and sort of see the security weaknesses in, in systems that were really not able to be analyzed before. Um, this is where you can get the article text. Um, they were published in 2600 Magazine in the spring. Um, if you guys want to write down these URLs before I show a couple of the, uh, a couple of the Metro cards. Okay, well, I think they'll be on the wiki or something. Okay, so. This is an example of a standard metro card. So I'll, I'll, I'll mute that. Um, okay, so you see, so you see, there's two records on here. Um, this this happens to be a 30-day unlimited card, so there's there's really not too much you could do with it. I'm reading track two right now. I'm not going to switch the head to read track three. But if I did read track three, it would it would output exactly what you saw on the slide. It would just give the serial number of the card and, and all this non-interesting stuff. Um, it shows the time of the last use. It shows how many times you used it. In this case, 
I, I usually find me 